Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. This is our ninth study in the Gospel of Matthew. We come today to Matthew chapter 19, verse 8. And Father, we ask that you would add your blessing to the word that we're about to study. In Jesus' name, amen. Did I say Matthew 19? I meant chapter 9, verse 8. <clears throat> Actually, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9. Get it straight here. It says, Then, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose, and he followed him. Tax collectors were hated by the Jews, because they were also Jews, but they collected taxes for Rome. And then to make matters worse, they collected more than what they were supposed to, and they would pocket the difference. Verse 10. And so it was, as Jesus sat at the table in the house, that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. Matthew throws a dinner party, and Jesus is the guest of honor. And Matthew, who knows that he has found something real, something real and he found forgiveness wants his friends to get in on it also and so he invites all his low-life sinful friends over to have supper with Jesus 11 and when the Pharisees saw it they said to his disciples why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners well, I've got a question why don't you look why don't you look Christ in the eye and ask him yourself why do you talk what do you talk behind his back? Verse 12. And when Jesus heard that, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus did not apologize because he was eating with sinners. And he didn't deny that he was eating with sinners. He did eat with them. And if he'd been eating with a bunch of Pharisees and scribes and religious rulers instead of those tax collectors, he still would have been eating with sinners. 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The scribes knew a lot about religious offerings and religious sacrifices, but they had no sympathy for lost sinners or for man in general and God's more interested in compassion than he is in religion verse 14 then the disciples of John came to him saying why do we and the Pharisees fast often but your disciples do not fast John's disciples are puzzled because they along with their leader John the Baptist would fast but Jesus and his disciples didn't. And they want to know why. I mean, if John and Jesus are both from God, then why don't they operate in the same way? Verse 14. Last, or verse 14 and 15 together. It says, John's disciples came to him asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus is saying, These few years that I am here with my disciples are a time of celebrating. There are good things happening. I'm healing the sick. I'm raising the dead. It simply doesn't make sense to mourn and fast when so many wonderful things are happening be plenty of time for sad things after I'm gone. Verse 16. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. If you patch an old pair of jeans with a piece of cloth from some unshrunk material, that patch will shrink and rip. It's going to rip a, an even bigger hole in your jeans than what you had to begin with. Jesus' point is this. Don't mix the old with the new. Don't try to put God in a box and say, if he wants me to do that this way, then he wants everyone to do it that way. He's also saying that. But primarily, 
don't mix the old with the new. And for John's disciples, it means don't try to mix the Old Testament law with the message of grace that Jesus preached. 17. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. The pressure caused by fermenting grape juice would cause old, stretched out wineskins to break. And in the same way, the joy that a personal relationship with Christ brings cannot be contained within the rituals and rules and regulations of religion. In other words, Jesus is offering more than the Old Testament religion with all of its rituals and sacrifices. He is offering people a personal walk with God that's much better and much bigger than just religion. 18. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. Most of the Jewish rulers despised Jesus, and even if some didn't, they would never admit it. But this ruler was too desperate to worry about what his colleagues would say. All he knows is that his daughter is dead, he is crushed, and Jesus is his only hope. 19. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. The fact that this man was a Jewish ruler didn't stop Christ from going with him. You know, the, as I said, the rulers didn't like Jesus, but Jesus didn't care about the way this man evidently was. didn't care about anything that he may have done in the past. The man humbled himself and cried out to Christ. So Christ shows compassion and goes with him. 20. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years, came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. With Jesus it was another day, another interruption. And his teaching had been interrupted by the ruler who lost his daughter, and, or was losing his daughter, and now his walk to the daughter is interrupted by the sick woman. It was one interruption after another, but you never hear Jesus say, Will you people just please give me a break? He had a servant's heart. Still does. 21. For she said to herself, If I only may touch his garment, I shall be made well. Now there was some superstition in this woman. Because back in those days, people believed that if you had touched the garment of a holy man, you would be blessed. That's superstition. That's not good. But let's look at verse 22. It says, But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. And she no doubt felt better immediately, too. When you've been bleeding for 12 years, man, your red blood cells are going to be very low, and you're going to be tired and weak. So when she was healed, she must have got an immediate zap of energy. Verse 23. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, he said to them, Make room, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn. To Jesus she was sleeping, because he knows he's going to raise her. Verse 25. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all the land. I wonder what this girl was looking at or listening to in heaven when she was told that she was returning to earth. You know, not, many people enter into heaven on a daily basis, but not many people leave heaven and return to earth. And I've got to believe she was disappointed. But God is God and He has a right to bless us or remove any blessing from us any time He wants to. 27. When Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David means Messiah. 20, 28. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, you, yes Lord. 
Jesus didn't ask, How much do you believe? He asked, Do you believe? Faith isn't measured by the pound. It is a yes or no issue. You either believe God's word is true, or you don't. You either believe God is, God's word is true, so you live by it, or you don't. You either believe God can do something, so you ask, or you don't. Someone says, well, I want great faith. Well, then read the Bible. Because the more you read the Bible, the more you'll know God, and the more you know God, the more you'll trust Him. And the more you trust Him, the more you'll live by His word, no matter what that means. And that is great faith. 29. Then He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. They believed enough to follow Christ, and they believed enough to call out to Christ, and so they got their healing. Real faith, you see, perseveres through obstacles. Real faith doesn't quit simply because things get tough. Verse 30, And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. Jesus didn't want people flocking to him primarily to see miracles. He didn't want excitement over miracles to distract people from the things that he was saying, that is, the word of God that he was teaching. 31. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all that country. They disobeyed. And I don't care how excited they were or how grateful they were, it was still disobedience. The best thank you we can give God for anything He does for us is to obey Him. 32. As they went out, behold, they brought to Him a man, mute and demon-possessed. And when the de demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. The common people were excited. I mean, they were talking about Jesus. Miracles like he was doing never happened before. I mean, first he gave life to the dead, then he gave sight to the blind, and then he gave speech to the speechless. 34. But the Pharisee says, said, He cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. Jesus' enemies could not deny his miracles, so they attacked him personally. The common people were excited about Jesus, and so the religious leaders who were jealous of Christ were frantically trying to discredit him. 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Jesus, like a politician on a whistle-stop tour, travels around Israel announcing that he is their messianic king and that if the nation repented and acknowledged his lordship, he would reign over them and bring in the wonderful millennial kingdom age. And to prove that his offer was legitimate, and that he was not just a messianic crackpot, he did all sorts of miracles, predicted that the Messiah would do in the Old Testament. 36. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. The people were not getting the guidance that they needed from their spiritual leaders. Oh, they were, being, they were given religion, but they were not given the word of God. And as a result, many lives were, were lived in confusion, and many souls were dying and going to hell. 37. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And it's no different today. The spiritual needs of the world are much greater than the workforce that God can count on. 38. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, if Jesus asked his disciples to pray for workers to be sent into God's kingdom, then it's a good idea for us to pray for that also. You know, if you pray for God to, to raise up workers for His kingdom, probably two things will happen. God will send out workers. And number two, those of us who pray will be among them if we are not already. And maybe, just maybe, someone we care about 
may get saved as a result. Very important prayer to pray. And we'll stop there for today and pick up our study.